So welcome and um, welcome to part, I think where are we, part five or six on uh, the doctrine of salvation. And we at this point have been looking quite carefully at what God has been doing for us. And so we've been focusing on things like um, the doctrines of what salvation is and looking at these words that fit into the experience and doctrine of salvation. Things like propitiation, redemption, reconciliation. We've been looking at the work of the cross and seeing specifically at what the Lord has done for us in terms of revealing His love and displaying His justice and showing how He has authority over things like evil and sickness and how He's broken the back of the devil. And we've been focusing on the Lord and what He has done. Now this next section, there's going to be almost a slight shift in a gaze to looking at what we do in response to Him. Now, that has been happening, obviously, as we've been looking through this material, but going to be focusing a bit more on, on that, per se, um, in this next section. And so, again, the focus is still the Lord, but there will be a shift in terms of what we do in response to Him and the outworking of our salvation. Now, the title of the session is The Order of Salvation Introduction. There will be in your notes, and I'll be focusing on the first aspect, which is calling calling. And in Latin, order of salvation is ordo salutis. It's an old word, and it really is a man-made word to try and describe the process or event in which God takes a Christian through from the beginning of our salvation experience through to the end. Um, And so there are different scriptures that speak about that. The fact that there's this progression, there's a sequence of events that takes place in the Christian life that Um, starts off with the very call of God that we'll be looking at just now, how it always initiates with the Lord rather than with man. So we see scriptures like Romans 8, verse 29 to 30, which is probably the pivotal scripture that shows us that, in a sense, there's an order in our salvation. There's a sequence of events that takes place as we come to know the Lord. So Romans 8, 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn from among many brothers. And for those he predestined, he called. And for those he called, he justified. And for those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so here there's a sequence that takes place. There's this process that we see that starts in his his work at predestination, going all the way through to this aspect of glorification that we'll be touching on in a few weeks' time. Then we see another scripture where Jesus tells a parable in Mark chapter 4. And he says this, and Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And so Jesus is explaining the ways of the kingdom of God. And he doesn't just say that the kingdom of God, boom, comes, and you know you wake up in the morning and the, the plant has been fully grown uh, from nothing to miraculously. They're, they're, in a sense, there's this, you know, first the seed, then it, it sprouts forth, then the blade, then the ear, then the full grain, it blossoms out, and there's this process. And so this picture that we have is very important. And uh, a few sessions ago, we dealt with how salvation is not only an event, it is an event, but it is a process. In other words, we looked at the three tenses that you have been saved, Scripture teaches about, we are being saved, and one day we will be saved. And so this is looking at this scriptural idea, but from a, um, a, from a different angle, kind of a theological angle. Now, the main doctrines or teachings that we'll cover over this period of how we come into a full salvation experience can be headed as the following. Firstly, calling is the first one. and We'll be looking at that now. The second one is conversion. And under conversion, we'll be looking at faith and repentance, or repentance and faith. It's two aspects of conversion. The third aspect of the order of salvation is regeneration. Now, who of you know what regeneration means. It means being given a new heart, that process where you get born again. 
The fourth one is sanctification. And we'll be looking at that in more detail. And the fifth one is glorification. So, as I said earlier, that the Bible does not explicitly give these five teachings uh, in that specific order. But there's enough of an indication in the Bible that shows that there is this process, this order. Now, among Bible scholars over the last 2,000 years, among Jesus-loving people, there's been disagreement even over this order. For example, some, and Mike Davies, Mike Davies touched on it in the last session very eloquently, very helpfully, of, of how, for example, with a Calvinist position. In other words, a position of, of, a, of people who tend to look at the Bible through the lens of the sovereignty of God, and they, they read that through the lens. For them, they, uh, and rightly so, to uphold the fact that God takes glory for our salvation. What they do in the order of salvation is they would put regeneration before conversion. And they would say, no, 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 the Spirit has to make you born again before you actually respond. There's already a work that's taken place in your heart before you respond in faith. And there's reasons for that that we, we might touch on later. But we see, I'm putting it this way around because from, as I read Scripture, as plainly as I can be, through the lens of not only the sovereignty of God, but of the love of God and the goodness of God, we see that um, conversion comes before regeneration. And I'll explain why that is. So bear with me if these things seem a bit Greek to you. Um, It'll be explained as we go along. And so let's look at the first thing of calling and how salvation starts with this powerful word, calling. And calling is a word that's used throughout the scripture. And the heart of calling speaks about, again, the activity of God, of how he initiates something in order for us to respond to. And the very word call means that he's the one that has spoken it out and, our, and, and all we have to do is to respond to that call. And we look in Scripture to see how God calls individuals, but He calls nations, and He chooses nations to serve Him. So quickly, these are some of the points I want to look at um, in the session. Firstly, I want to give some introduction points on calling, just some, some thoughts as we dive in. Secondly, I want to be looking at God's choosing behind our calling, and these aspects are mysterious. I'm not going to uh, uh, pretend that we are now going to unpack the mysteries so we all now understand the mystery of God. The things that we're going to be diving into and some of the scriptures looking at, we understand there is the mystery of God. We're looking at it through a finite lens at the infinite wisdom and, and grace and power of God, the way he works. We can't understand these things fully. So I'm not pretending to, but however we are trying to do as best as we can to think through the ways of the Lord, uh, because it does, we need to have understanding, the Bible says, um, on these things. So we're looking at God's choosing beyond a calling, then we're going to be looking at God's choosing, how it's linked to our faith, and then lastly we're going to be looking at God's grace behind our faith. And so I'm given it that type of uh, breakdown for that. Now just some uh, points that I want to start off with, just some intro points on calling, just to, to lay the platform. Firstly, I want to say that Scripture teaches that when God calls, He calls all people to be saved. And so we're speaking about calling in a salvation context. I'm not speaking about calling in terms of a calling into um, ministry to be used in an aspect by God. I'm speaking more about calling for salvation. As we look at the difference, I want to clarify something as we dive in, talking about the difference of election for to, uh, calling, I'm sorry, f towards salvation and calling towards service. And there's a sense where if you read the heart of God for salvation, there's no doubt that's given indiscriminately, so to speak. I mentioned um, uh, the parable in Matthew 22, and this will be brought up again in the course of the teaching, in Matthew 22, where the invitation is given out to all, uh, initially to the Jews, they reject but then it's thrown out to everyone, and there's an indiscriminate invitation given because Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, Scripture says. So there's an unlimited scope. There is a, uh, the same type of salvation is given to all that are given, called to be children of God to one Father, called to the same inheritance, so to speak, which is eternal life, which is to know Him. So that is the calling to salvation that I'll be focusing on. 
But there is another call, which speaks about the call in one sense to service. And again, if we look through Scripture, this is discriminate in one sense. This is a sense where God chooses some and not others. He chooses some to be apostles and not others. He chooses, for example, when he chose the 12, Jesus went and he chose 12 specific men and he ignored others. Why did he do that? Because he was calling them for service. While the Jews, these 12 apostles, they were part of the Israel of God. They were part of the chosen people. They were all part of that that inheritance that would receive salvation by faith. But a number of them were chosen specifically for a specific task. And so you've got scriptures like 1 Corinthians 12 that deals with how the Spirit apportions gifts to whom He wishes. There's certain that people that just are, are, have been given certain gifts and some who are five talent people and others who receive two talents. Why does the Lord do that? We don't know. Because He can. Because He's sovereign. Because He's the all-wise, all-knowing one. And just to distinct, uh, clarify the difference between the two, it's important that we understand that there's a, a calling for salvation and there's a calling for service. A calling which with that service comes gifts given in order to bless the body, um, such as apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers. Uh, your gifting that God has given you, the way you're wired is unique and called to something someone else wouldn't be. So just something to clarify as we dive further into this teaching. So in Isaiah 45, it said, um, Isaiah writes, the Lord is speaking, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And the call that goes out, it's a call to the ends of the earth. It's a call to nations. It's a call to not just the select group that were the Jews who were the chosen people of God, but he had called them specifically so that through them, the nations of the earth would be blessed. The intent of God was never just that the Jews would experience salvation. He called Abraham as the father of the Jews, and he said to Abraham, through you, the nations will be blessed. God's intent is always that the Samaritans, the Philistines, the Egyptians, the Syrians, the Arabians, you name it, that they would come to salvation to know Yahweh, the one true God. And so that was God's heart. Um, for it. That's God. We must understand it's the heart of God. God's call is for everyone. We look at scriptures like Matthew 22 verse 9 of the parable of the wedding feast and how Jesus actually calls out the Jews, but they rejected the call. They didn't want to come in. And if you look at that on your own, you'll be able to see that he throws out the invitation to everyone and he invites, it says, all they could find. In other words, it was just thrown open as a as a call to say, if you come in, it's, it's, there's no limit to my invitation list, so to speak. So just an intro point. Now, on this, how does God call? If God calls all to be saved, how does he do that? Well, scriptures like 2 Thessalonians 2 says, to this he called you through our gospel. So the gospel is the means that people hear the call of God and respond to salvation. Obviously, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's the means. Another means, and this I've heard in, uh, from legitimate sources, for example, in Muslim nations that are close to the gospel, that people have come to salvation through dreams and visions. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit is used, obviously, primarily the, the means of the gospel, but also we've, seen a st- we've heard stories, legitimate stories, of people um, having experiences with the risen Christ, of Jesus appearing to them and them experiencing salvation that way. God calls all people, and primarily through the gospel, but even through things like dreams, visions, etc. Then, secondly, this intro points on calling is that we find that not many people respond to the call of God. And this is actually a sad indictment, because people love darkness more than light. And so this is the reality of the world we're living in, and it's a sad indictment on the human condition and the human heart, that the human heart is so closed. And obviously, that's why we need the grace of God, but just something to keep in mind. Thirdly, Scripture shows that those who respond to God's call find salvation. So for those who respond to the hearing of the gospel, the work of the Spirit, find salvation. Scriptures like Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And so we call on his name because he has called our names. And the reason he's called you out by name, so Alice, you're, he's called you out by name. He knows the hairs on your head. And because of that, we can call on the name of the Lord. Even the, the word church, interestingly enough, you know what church means? The word church means, uh, it's a Greek word, ecclesia, and it means the called out ones. So when we gather together as the people of God to worship God, to hear his word, what's happening is it's just all the called out ones coming together to love him and worship him. So let's look at now God's choosing behind our call uh, when we respond. To, we, I use this word, our calling. And Romans 8 verse 30 says, And to those he predestined, he also called. And so what is behind calling? It's predestination, those who predestined. And so we believe in the importance of predestination. What is predestination? Well, if you go to the root word, pre, to be predestined essentially means to be chosen in advance. God's choosing, and he's chosen or appointed, he's picked out people way in advance. And so Jeremiah, um, uh, he knew this. Uh, before we look at that, let's look at Timothy, um, and, and 2 Timothy 2, where Paul says, but the Lord who saved us and called us to holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ before the ages began. There's something profound here that God would choose us way before, and he would appoint us and prepare a salvation for us even before we were born, even before the earth was, was made. There's something profound about that. We see Jeremiah acknowledges this, and, um, and this is profound. Jeremiah says, and now the word of the Lord came to me saying, well, um, the Lord says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, what happened? I knew you. That's profound. That he didn't just plan and, and, and have this plan of, I'm going to create Jeremiah the prophet, but he actually knew him intimately, even before he was born. How does that work? Don't know. But it's profound. And he carries on and says, Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That word appointed, he, it's a similar word to predestination. It's a sense of like, I have assigned something for you. And we have this idea that God is such a wise God that his salvation is a plan that started from before the ages began. And Mike Davies um, explained this aspect of predestination in the last session. I'm not going to recover that too much. He did a good job in explaining um, what predestination is and how it's a father that prepares a future uh, for his children. What I do want to say is that predestination is not predetermination. There's a difference. In other words, it's not fatalism. And some groups of people um, I know even Spurgeon fought against them uh, when he was around in the, in the uh, 19th century, and they were called hyper-Calvinists. And the hyper-Calvinists were those that held to such a strong doctrine of predestination of the fact that God has chosen you in advance. What they did is they stopped preaching the gospel because they said, well, the Lord has predetermined those who'd get saved. But what happened was it became fatalism. Or what will be will be. It's like the man that walks down the stairs, he trips and falls, <laughs> lands, ah, oh, gets up, and, and he says, ah, oh, thank goodness that's over. Thank goodness, sure, I've, okay, that's been ticked off the list now. The Lord ordained that, and now, thank goodness that's over. And it's just, it's fatalism. And God has not called us to that kind of faith. And, and as we'll look just now, as I'll go through some of the points, the idea of God's choosing, it's not something arbitrary, something where he said, well, I'll choose you for salvation, but I won't choose you. Almost like boys on a soccer field at break time when you're choosing sides and choosing teams. Oh, yeah, I'll choose John, but I'll, I won't choose Peter. And, and you standing there hoping that you get chosen. And for some Christians, this idea of predestination, of this choosing in advance, has that slant to it. But I want to argue that that is not the kind of predestination that I believe is a biblical picture because it's not rooted in the nature of God. 
You see, the nature of God is a God who has shared himself with us in a very real way. And I'll be looking at how that unpacks now now. So God's choosing, however, is behind our calling. That's very important to acknowledge and know. Um, Secondly, God's choosing is linked to our faith. We see scripture teaches. And we find many New Testament scriptures that when it speaks about election, God's appointing for us to salvation, it speaks about it in context to being in Christ Jesus, of believing in Christ Jesus. God's choosing is linked to our faith. Let's look at a few scriptures that deal with this. First one's 2 Thessalonians 2. But we always ought to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you. Amen. Okay. Now, he doesn't stop there. God chose you. He chose you. He took the initiative. He reached out to you. He rescued you to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And there's two aspects here we see. The first one is it's a work of the Spirit. Secondly, it's a work of man. It's belief in the truth. It's something that he, not partners is the wrong word, but he works with us and we have to respond in a very real way. And we see how, if you look carefully there, how the choosing of God is linked up to our belief in the truth. Let's look at another scripture that speaks about this. Ephesians 1, 4 to 5. And here, the emphasis is different because it says that as he chose us, in him. You see, it's faith in him. We're chosen in Christ. That is the key. So Christ, and here, it's not just our faith and election that go together, our belief in the truth, but it's election and Jesus that go together. It's our faith in Jesus. In other words, you can't... Be an elect son of God if you're not in Jesus. Um, Christ is the key to our election. So if you want to know if you're chosen by God, if you're elect, are you in Jesus? And if you've put your faith in Jesus, if you're in him, then we see that you're elect. That's what it says, that, that he's, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Let's look at Ephesians 1.11. In him... We've obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So it works like this. At the end of the day, the one who is the chosen one, the one who's the precious one is actually Jesus. The one who was ordained before the foundation of the world for our sins is Christ. He's the one loved by the Father. He's the chosen one. He's the firstborn over all creation. He was the one that the Father said, you are my son, um, and we'll send you to the, to the earth. Although we believe it's, the Son wasn't created, He was with the Father. But if we align ourselves with the precious Son, then we find election. That's the way God has linked it up together. Election and being in Christ go together. Rodman Williams says it much better than I think I could. So if you're confused, hopefully Rodman Williams will clarify something of this to us. He's... Um, an author, and Rodman Williams says this, it is not because we are elected that we are able to believe, but we are elected as believers. If one, even for a moment, steps outside of the correlation of election and faith, the situation becomes meaningless. Election is relationed only to those in Christ. Outside of him, there is no election. Thus, it is the people of faith who are the elect people of God. So it's not arbitrary. If you want to know, but am I elect? Have, have, am I one of God's chosen? Because there have been many in church history that have lived with a paralyzing fear of, but am I chosen? Am I doing this in vain? Because maybe I'm not predestined for salvation. Maybe I haven't been appointed in advance. Well, if you're hiding yourself in Jesus and you're throwing yourself upon him, then you're elect. Believers are those are the elect people of God. That's what he says. And we see this linking up between the two. We, we, we're in him. Now, some of you might think of a scripture like Matthew 22, verse 14, the one up here, that says, no, but 
there are scriptures that seem to contradict what you've said, even contradict maybe what the scriptures you pulled up here. For example, Matthew twenty two fourteen says how Jesus says this: many are called, so yes, ah, but few are chosen. So there's something of the secret will of God, the mystery of predestination, that although, this is what some teach, God throws out a general call to all people, he actually has a special elect within that, that he knows that he's given, um, that the Holy Spirit will draw to salvation. There's a certain group of people that are chosen, even though everybody's called. So I'm, maybe I'm not among the chosen. But if we look carefully at this, we see, if you look at, and it's a parable that Jesus is, that's the parable of the, um, I think this is the parable of the, of the wedding feast. If you look at the picture, why weren't they chosen? And in verse 3, if you go back in the parable, you find out the reason they were not chosen to enter. Let's look. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding but they would not come. In other words, it's linked to something of our response, our faith. Our, there's something of a linking in with, with what man does to this choosing. That's the point that I'm trying to make here, that I think Jesus is trying to make. We can't take one scripture and take it out of context and forget the context of Matthew 22. And some folk love to quote this, say, ah, but only some are chosen. But if you look at why they're chosen, it's because they're rejected the invitation from the Lord of the banquet. So election is not an arbitrary decision. Now, I want to get back to what I said earlier about that this thing of faith, why it's so important, why election is linked to our faith in Jesus is because I think it's rooted in the nature of God, that God's nature is that he's a father, he's a creator, that he's a lover, that when he created us, he created us for real relationship with him. If God wanted to choose arbitrarily some to be saved and some not to be, he could have created robots, couldn't he have? He could have just created those that he knew would automatically obey him. But God doesn't work like that. He knew that some would spurn him, some would reject him, some would disobey him. And he wanted genuine relationship with us. Because if it's not, gen it's not love, love has to be um, risky in order for it to be love. Otherwise, it cannot be love. And so this heart for all that God has to be saved is such an important part of the gospel. You've got 1 Timothy 2, where uh, it speaks about that his desires for all to be saved come to knowledge of the truth. 1 John 2.2 2, uh, speaks about how Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. So in him choosing people, his heart is that he chooses all rather than limited. So we believe that election is potentially unlimited in scope rather than limited it's unlimited. Now, I want to look at the next point here, which is God's grace behind our faith. And it seems like we're just simply going around in circles. <laughs> in one sense, we are because we, we're delving and celebrating the mystery of these things. But behind our faith and our ability to respond to the gospel and believe in Jesus and be the elect chosen ones of God, it comes about, um, obviously as we believe, but behind faith is grace. In other words, it is God's empowering, enabling you to believe on him and to trust in him. You can't take credit for that. And I know some folk um, that hold to a very strong view of the sovereignty of God and in God's work in salvation. No, but he does it all. And, and, if, if, and they're scared that man gets the glory, so they're focused purely in God's um, saving power. But what we find is, is, is that if we understand grace, we know that God always gets the glory if we understand grace. And we look at scriptures like this, profound scriptures. Jesus mentions, this is absolutely profound. John 6 verse 44, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's profound. He's saying that you think you've come to me because you've made a choice, because you've been seeking me and, and, and reaching out to me. But that, that very ability that you've had actually comes from me. I've given you the ability to draw near to me. I've been the one that's opened up your heart for you to respond to me. 
And so this is called different things. Um, certain Bible scholars over the years have called the term prevenient grace. Prevenient grace. John Wesley used that term and others. And it means a grace that precedes our decisions. So in other words, before every decision you make or um, you know, as you work, grace has worked before you. Grace works enabling you to work, enabling you to respond. And the whole Christian life is we speak about saving grace. So for us to believe on the Lord, there's a grace given to us to actually respond to him. Now, does God give that grace only to some people and not to others? Well, clearly, if we look at God's heart for the whole world and if we understand his nature, we must believe that his grace has been given to all to respond. And obviously, people have an, ha, can re, re, resist that grace. It's not an irresistible grace. In one sense, it's a resistible grace because if love is genuine, then we must be able to, to reject it. And that's why in the New Testament, we find that there's very real warnings to Christians and people, that they're very real warnings saying that we have to continue to believe and we have to continue to um, uh, watch out and be careful because it's possible to spurn the grace of God, to shipwreck our faith. We've got to remain in Him, to abide in Him, to believe on Him, to trust in Him ongoingly. And um, Jesus says here that it's the Father who draws Him. It's the Father who draws Him. And so if someone wants to come to faith, and they've come and they've said, I want to, I want to get saved. I want to give my life to Christ. I, I know that I'm a sinner and I need to, I want to make a decision for Christ. It's the spirit that has given them, has, has stirred them within them. But the thing is, is to, they simply are not resisting. They're, they're, they're submitting. They're saying, Lord, come and do your work in me. And because we don't resist, we can be drawn in. For those who resist are the ones who, with, who resist the drawings of the Father, so to speak. So, I want to say that in all of this, God gets the glory. You know, you look at a scripture, some of you might have this in your mind, when one of the most important scriptures when it comes to salvation, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Some of you might know it. Hopefully you would know it. It says that it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And it's not a gift. It is, um, let's just actually read it because I'm... Uh, I'm getting tongue-tied. I've got too many things running through my head. But he speaks about that it's not a, a, it's a gift of God. It carries on to say. Let's just read it in its context. And before I butcher the scripture, um, <laughs> Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works that no one may boast. So even your faith is a gift from God. Even that ability to, to say, yes, save me, is a gift from God. And I believe it's a gift given to all. Some have chosen to resist that gift. But for those who get saved, say, Lord, I'm going to surrender under that. And I'm going to res res surrender under the call of God. And so God gets the glory, man. In everything, God gets the glory. Let's make sure that salvation is about Him. That calling starts with Him, initiates in Him. He's a good Father who loves us and calls us and draws us to His side.